Hello and welcome to the second webinar by Search for Common Ground on Countering Violent Extremism. In this webinar, we'll look at the drivers of violent extremism and ways that we can understand them in a particular context. So when we use the term drivers of violent extremism, uh, we define them as causes or reasons why groups or individuals might be attracted to supporting or engaging in violent extremism. Now, there are many frameworks that we use to help us understand these various reasons why someone might come to join a violent extremist group or to have ideas to support such actions. Um, in the following video by UNESCO, you'll get the chance to listen to stories from three former extremists who will recount their experiences and the reasons they found appeal in extremism. The video will also review one particular framework for understanding the drivers of violent extremism, and you can access it by clicking on the picture on your screen. As you saw in the video, one of the most widely used frameworks for understanding the drivers of violent extremism are push factors and pull factors. We will also seek to include what was also kind of highlighted in the video um, called group dynamics and relationships. Now, push factors are any condition or grievance that creates a sense of frustration, marginalization, and disempowerment that can encourage people to seek out remedies, including, but not necessarily limited to, joining extremist groups. On the other hand, pull factors are forces that can be attractive to potential re recruits and specifically draws them into radical organizations. This can be things such as a sense of kinship, heroism, adventure, um, but they can also be things like economic gain or, or a person's own self-realization. However, and often overlooked in this, in this framework is group dynamics and relationships. And these are the things which really shape the issues that people face, especially those things identified as, as push factors. And we would define them as the factors that shape the issues, environment, and community in ways that make individuals or communities more vulnerable to violent extremism. These are often overlooked. Um, now, other frameworks may refer to push factors as structural factors, um, such as those things in the environment that create conflict, divisions, and tensions. Um, they may also describe pull factors as individual incentives. In this way, we can understand pull factors to be those things that make violent extremism or a particular violent extremist group to be appealing to an individual or to a group that's trying to achieve their goals. In countering violent extremism, we have to be very cautious about these drivers, um, especially in their respective contexts in which we're working. And this is because um, the issue of violent extremism is a highly contextual issue, meaning that its causes or, or, or even its forms are different in any particular area. Therefore, let's look at these following guiding questions on the drivers of violent extremism. We first have to ask, what is the risk of violent extremism in our context and what are its forms? This question is important because, uh, for example, in some areas, we might not have much of a risk of violent extremism, whereas others might have a much higher risk. This, however, this also requires that we have an understanding of what kind of violent extremist ideologies or groups are active in that particular area. And this can change based on the context and the issues at play. Related to this is the second question which is why are people drawn to violent extremism? This question really delves into those drivers of violent extremism. Um, however, these drivers can really be different according to the different groups that are active in a particular area. So sometimes we, we may need to ask this question separately for each form of violent extremism, or even for every group in an area, because these can have nuanced differences that would change the way that we, um, that we design our programming. We might also 
well, we especially need to understand that men and women can sometimes be recruited in very gendered ways. And they can have gender specific differences in the ways that they were recruited and why. The third question, who is being drawn to violent extremism, helps us to identify, you know, not some profile of a potential violent extremist, but which people in a particular community or which groups or, or what have you might be more vulnerable to the appeal of violent extremism. The fourth question, where are people being drawn to violent extremism helps us to identify the so-called hot spots where recruitment and radicalization are occurring more frequently so that we can target our programming more effectively. These can be specific venues or locations where radicalization or recruitment occur, such as uh, the internet, informal religious spaces, or even just friend and social groups. The fifth question, how are people being radicalized it helps us to understand the methods and the manners in which people come in contact with violent extremism or extremists themselves and be become recruited. For example, many people in the Middle East, Europe, Central Asia, and other places around the world have been radicalized by coming in contact with ISIL supporters, whether in their home countries or through social media that had been able to convince them to leave their countries and travel to Syria and Iraq to join the group. Let's look at one particular example from Belgium of a young woman who took her young child to, uh, to, uh, to Syria to join ISIL. So while you watch the video, pay attention to the things that she was promised by the recruiter if she would move to Syria but also pay attention to those aspects of her own life that might have made her more, more vulnerable to this idea of radicalization. You can access the video by clicking on the picture on your screen. Now, a great deal of research has been done on the drivers of violent extremism across the world. However, before we begin a countering violent extremism program, it's, it's really important that we ourselves come to understand the local dynamics of violent extremism so we can have the most effective programming possible. This means that we should review the research or even the programming that has been done in the particular area and even in related contexts. And it may even mean that we need to conduct our own research. However, it's very important that we approach researching the drivers of violent extremism in, in a way that employs a do no harm approach. This means that we should be cautious about our, uh, our research teams and, and really conscious about how they may be perceived by research participants and, and to be sure to ensure their security and safety. This goes for our research participants as well who should really feel comfortable enough to participate freely um, so that they give us the most accurate responses. Because if they're for some reason afraid of the reper repercussions uh, about talking about sensitive issues like violent extremism or grievances in their, in their context, they may not be as forward or as open about the things that we would need to learn. So of course, we should always be especially cautious when we involve children in our research. This includes getting parental permission and any other necessary protective measures. Finally, as we conduct our research and write our reports, we should have clear definitions and be consistent with their use so that both our research teams and the participants and even the readers themselves will, have, will all have common understandings of what we're referring to. We should also be appropriately skeptical about what we are told by research participants. Like journalists uh, doing stories, we may be told things by former violent extremists uh, when there are research participants um, that aren't very true. For example, they may talk about what drove them to become radicalized um, in ways that, uh, that make themselves appear more innocent. Um, such as telling us that they only joined for money and not because they adopted the group's ideology. They do this so that they may no longer, so that they're, they don't appear any longer as a threat. Um, therefore, we should really seek to co corroborate the information we receive through multiple sources. 
to really verify that information. We should also be realistic about what our findings tell us so that when we draw our conclusions from the research, we don't overstate the value of what we actually found. This means being open to saying that we just don't have definitive answers or that more research is needed in a specific area. Finally, when we write reports to our colleagues, our donors, and even the public at large, we should be very open about the methodology we used, as well as the limitations of our research. This allows the readers to judge for themselves. Um, finally, we just wanted to wrap up this matter with the following key takeaways. First, violent extremism and radicalization are highly context specific, meaning that the drivers of violent extremism and the process of radicalization uh, in an area may not be the same in another area, even if it's close by. Second, violent extremism and radicalization are complex issues, but we've actually learned a lot about them that are helpful in guiding countering violent extremism programs and policies. This means that there's a lot of research that's been done that we can benefit from. But we shouldn't be afraid about conducting our own research or, uh, or even uh, through informal evaluations on the drivers of violent extremism in our own context before beginning a prog uh, program. Uh, this is very important. Third, preventing and countering violent extremism policies and programs are more effective when they are built on evidence-based research. Finally, um, safety and security are critical when studying violent extremism. And this includes the security of the participants as well as of our research teams themselves. Caution should always be used um, and protect, in protecting the identities of research participants whenever necessary. That's all for this module, but in the next module, we'll start to explore ways that we can get local actors involved in the field of countering violent extremism. Thank you.